Tech Time Traveler here again, and you know, I've been enjoying messing around with quote-unquote modern computers like my Tandy 2500XL and seeing old VGA games and such again. But lately I've had an itch to return to where truly personal computing began, the good old mid-1970s. And what a better vehicle to take for a drive than this 1976 Digital Group Z80. I have a confession to make. I'm a Digital Group groupie. Ever since I first encountered Digital Group via an auction for this quote-unquote basic box nearly a decade ago, I've been absolutely fascinated and dedicated to collecting whatever I could of their legacy. I even did a full-length documentary on the company, the card for which I'll leave here if you haven't seen it yet. Digital Group was one of the earliest personal computing pioneers, felled by poor finances, internal dysfunction, and good old-fashioned hubris, lasting just over five years in business. Over the last decade, I've been collecting Digital Group bits and pieces as I found them. Due to a combination of relative scarcity and very deep-pocketed other collectors, I've only managed to collect bits here and there. But I have over time managed to land two complete systems, including several 8080 and Z80 processor boards, a rare FIDEC unit, case badge, keyboard, and EEPROM card. Anyway, every now and again I like to fire up my Z80 basic box because it is still one of my favorites, and I thought, since I'm doing that, why not get it on film? I did a very in-depth video on this particular machine previously, but that was years ago shot on a crappy, old, shaky camcorder. With far better cameras, I wanted to give this machine a new looky-loo with much better quality because I think it deserves that. A fully exhaustive video on digital group hardware and software could take hours, so instead I'm going to try to break things up here and just do a few videos over the coming months just to give viewers some of the flavor of an authentic 70s computer experience. What got me on this kick was seeing some tiny basic programs listed in an old digital group sales flyer in my recent unfridging video. I realized I might have some of those very tapes in my collection, and it turns out I do. So let's get this old girl up and running again, and then we'll spend some time with the Tiny Basic software library that Digital Group offered to its customers. If you don't know what Tiny Basic is, as the name implies, it's a very compact version of Basic, aka the beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code. Tiny Basic arose as the result of an infamous confrontation between early MITS Altair 8800 users and MITS itself, along with one Bill Gates. Gates and partner Paul Allen, upon hearing of the development of the Altair, thought they might make a few bucks for their young company by producing a version of BASIC for it. The Altair, of course, in its default configuration, couldn't do much of anything apart from enter the most rudimentary programs on the front panel and blink lights, but groups like the Homebrew Computer Club and MITS themselves eventually used the machine's expansion bus to their advantage and created a way to interface it with terminals like teletypes, making the use of languages like BASIC possible. The story goes that the Homebrew Computer Club, in the best hippie traditions of the recently departed 1960s, liked to swap paper tapes containing software for the Altair 8800 among their members. Share and share alike. Well, apparently one Don Sokol got his hands on a paper tape copy of Altair, or really Microsoft Basic, and went ahead and ran off several dozen copies of it for friends. To say Ed Roberts, head of MITS, was annoyed was an understatement. He basically called homebrew computer clubbers who used the paper tape copies thieves and insisted the practice stop. And then of course there was Bill Gates himself who wrote a, depending on your worldview, famous or infamous letter demanding hobbyists cease and desist with copying their intellectual property. This of course went completely against the communal spirit of early hobbyist groups and it received plenty of negative feedback. Their response was similar to what we see today with open source, freely distributed software like Firefox. A fellow named Bob Albrecht, one of the Homebrew Computer Club's members, suggested someone among the many computer science types in their group come up with a basic of their own that members could freely distribute and collaborate on, cutting Gates & Co. out of their lives as much as possible, an aspiration that still resonates here in 2023. Albrecht found a member of the Stanford University faculty named Dennis Allison, and Allison wrote out a specification for a basic that would fit in the very tight confines of early personal computer memory. It also called for a design that made it relatively easy to port from system to system, which was important given that personal computers were then pretty highly proprietary and very few common standards existed for design. The design spec was published in the September 1975 edition of the People's Computer Company newsletter. Among the most impactful submissions back to the magazine was Tiny Basic, which was developed by Dick Whipple and John Arnold and published in the January 1976 issue of Dr. Dobbs' Journal of Computer Calisthenics and Orthodontia magazine. Yeah, I think that name's kind of weird too. 
I hear Microsoft had a rival magazine planned, but Bill Gates didn't like the particular field of medicine they'd chosen for their name. Whipple and Arnold's aptly described tiny basic could fit in as little as three kilobytes of RAM, which was essential at a time when personal computers might not even have that much to start with. Their basic provided the essentials, including four next loops, along with a single numeric array. It was written in machine code using Octal, deviating from the original design specs requirement that it use an intermediate language for easy porting. I presume the idea being to run faster on machines that, in addition to having very little RAM, also had very little horsepower. TinyBasic raised a huge middle finger to Microsoft and quickly became popular among early computer users despite its limitations, including some businesses. Among those who developed their own variants were the Digital Group. Dr. Robert Suiting, Digital Group's chief engineer and part owner, ported TinyBasic to work with the Digital Group's TV cassette operating system. TVCOS was the secret sauce of Digital Group hardware. Digital Group machines, unlike their Altair brethren, required no teletype, no painstaking entry of a bootstrap loader via front panel switches, and there was no messing around with paper tape, all you needed was a cassette recorder. Digital Group machines were fully modern and featured direct video output along with direct keyboard input. On powering up a Digital Group machine, you had only to insert your program or OS tape and hit play. Take that, mitts. For this video, we're going to be taking a look at Tiny Basic and associated software. According to the last available flyer from Digital Group before they went bankrupt, there were six cassettes of Tiny Basic games produced for this system. I have three of those tapes in my collection. Brian Blackburn, aka Bike Collector, has a couple, although I think one of his overlaps with mine. So that's a grand total of four of the six original tapes. Considering how obscure Digital Group is, that's pretty good. I wish other Digital Group software collections were as relatively complete. Each tape retailed for $5 in the 1970s. That's about 25 bucks in today's money. Not crazy expensive, but not exactly cheap either. Now, I'm not expecting much in the way of excitement or complexity here. Tiny Basic, owing to its design parameters, had some pretty serious limitations. But I find programmers often do their best work when the constraints are really harsh, so we'll see. It's also interesting to explore software like this because you often get a taste of the culture programmers were living in at the time. Remember, many of these folks were programming just 30 years after World War II ended. 30 years ago from now is 1993. Mm. Of course, for our demonstration, we're going to be using all legit hardware here, for the most part. As at least one tape I want to demonstrate exists only in WAV format on the web, I will have to bring out my tablet here to act as a tape recorder stand-in, as I'm not going to bother transferring it back to a regular tape just for this video. Part of the point of this exercise is to verify what I have and then permanently digitize it, and then hopefully one day archive it online with others digitized tapes to form a more complete library of digital group software. These tapes are getting very, very old. Some of the oxide coating is wearing off and that's causing data loss. Plus, often when tapes sit for many years, the tape can become brittle or get stuck to the actual casing, and when you try to play, it snaps. This is exactly what happened with a couple of my tiny basic tapes, and thus we require a few repairs here before we can fully check out their contents. But yes, otherwise we'll be using this fully authentic setup with vintage Sanyo security monitor, a Superscope C101A cassette deck from 1976, and of course the star of the show, my Digital Group Z80 machine, which is housed in Digital Group's aptly named Basic Box. To prepare for this video, I did fire up the machine in my office to see how things sat. And initially the results weren't great. The machine had sat for a few years since my Digital Group video, and on power up I had problems with the video and with reading tapes. I realized that these issues abated somewhat when I flexed the card a little bit. So that made me suspect dry solder joints were at fault, which is a common enough problem. So I decided to reflow them. This repair took just a little bit of time, but with it done, things got immediately better. I also had to adjust the trimmer pot for the cassette read circuit a bit as I guess it had gotten a little bit out of tune, or maybe my fixing those loose connections changed audio levels or something? Not sure. The next thing I need to deal with are these broken tapes. I've been avoiding fixing these for years. I used to be a master of salvaging mangled cassettes. It was a necessity in a time when you might accidentally leave Van Halen to melt in your car on a hot summer day because you left them on your car seat. But, at least as far as I can remember, most of the cassettes I worked on were held together by screws which made them really easy to take apart and reassemble. These cassettes had their two halves bonded together with glue, and that makes for a yucky and risky for fingers process to take them apart. Basically, you've got to use a sharp edge and carefully cut along the seams to break the glue between the two halves, all while not letting all the contents spill out all over your table. 
Yeah, this is finicky. I think you're supposed to do this with an X-Acto knife, and I used to have one thanks to my other expensive hobby in model railroading, but I have not been able to locate it. So I'm going with box cutters instead, and uh, yeah, my hands are naturally shaky, so I'm tensed up waiting for the moment the knife inevitably slips and cuts me. <laughs> my crappy folding table here is making it look like I'm working in an earthquake, or that I'm just crazy strong. Luckily for me, both tapes had been fully rewound before I attempted to use them, so they'd gotten stuck basically on the plastic leader. That means that when they broke, the actual recorded portion should have been almost entirely untouched. Man, I am hating this. These tapes are really stuck together. I'm trying to cut just enough glue out from awkward places and open it gracefully without cutting the spool of tape inside, or my fingers. I'm going as carefully as I can here, the blade of the box cutter is binding all the way though. Just being really careful. I really don't want it to break apart. Damn it. Oh well, so much for gentle. At least it's open now. I don't exactly have sausage fingers, but my digits were more nimble when I was younger. Handling this tape now in my 40s is a little bit different than in my teens. Uh, and yeah, I seem to have lost a roller somewhere. One of them went under the digital group machine, but the other, I didn't see where it went at all. Darn it. Wait, I caught the explosion on camera. That at least will give me a clue. Ah, uh, yeah, it fell on the floor just behind me. Okay, now I remember some of the other frustrations of handling broken tapes, namely tapes spilling out all over the place from the spool and trying not to further damage or twist it by rolling it back. Now, there is a proper technique for splicing tapes back together as demonstrated in various YouTube videos, but I don't have the tools for that and given that it broke so close to the uncoated beginning of the tape, I'm comfortable with just removing the broken bit and then attaching the rest to the spool here and carefully putting it back. There's this tiny little chalk here that holds the tape in place. Through trial and error, I seem to have figured out that the best way to deal with it is to wrap the tape around the spool and then press the whole mess down onto the table like so. That'll do, Peg. That'll do. And the award for worst British accent ever goes to... With the tapes dry, I'm using my capture device to save the contents just in case. I've never done this sort of thing before. I find I have to keep the tape recorder at a very low volume setting for Adobe Edition to not max the volume out. The slightly lower points here are the leader, and the slightly elevated chunks are the programs themselves. One interesting thing that has emerged during the capture of the Tiny Basic Games Set 2 tape is the presence of something after the original game files. I count five ridges here at the beginning, which lines up with what was expected, as there are five games supplied on the tape. But then there's a break, and a whole bunch of new files. This tape originally had some masking tape over the right protection holes, so that's got me thinking that maybe the owner was using the spare tape available to store other stuff. That gets me hopeful that maybe one of the other tapes that neither I nor Brian have is recorded here. Looking at the waveform, I count six ridges, which tantalizingly enough is the same number of programs that would have been on tape number three. Hmm. Yeah, I'm probably dreaming. Let's get down to business here. I'm basically just picking a random smattering of programs that Digital Group supplied here. If you're used to modern gaming, this is going to seem pretty lame to you. But to put it in context, remember that this is somewhere between 1976 or 1977. The whole concept of having your own personal computer is foreign to most people, and you're doing something in your home that really wasn't possible for any price, even just a few years ago. To get going, we need to load up Tiny Basic itself. The tape we'll be using for this is the original Digital Group supplied cassette entitled Tiny Basic 10K. 10K refers to the RAM and actually sounds kind of big to me for a supposedly Tiny Basic, but we won't dwell on that. And let's just take a moment here to appreciate, again, not having to painfully toggle in a bootstrap loader on a front panel like those poor Altair suckers. Nope, all we have to do is turn the thing on and press play on our tape. It's just that simple. Another thing I love is that the digital group gave us a progress bar of sorts. We can watch on screen as the data is loaded into memory and we know right away if there's a problem. If any of these numbers change the dots or if there's any interruptions or if the stream is too slow, then it means something's wrong with the memory or the computer itself and we definitely have a problem. At the end of the load process, the system is supposed to immediately reset and load the program. If it doesn't do that, then you've got another problem somewhere else. Loading Tiny Basic usually takes a couple of minutes. I'm in awe that this ancient super scope actually works. 
And there we are. This is the tiny basic system menu, which is arranged like most digital grip software with a short menu of functions. I believe that copy of the OS resides here as well. So yeah, it's not actually tiny basic that's running things on this particular menu. One thing you might notice with the first two options on screen here is that loading and saving tiny basic programs is done from this external menu, not inside the tiny basic interpreter itself. I'm not sure how that is handled in other versions of Tiny Basic, but that's how Digital Group rolls. Conveniently, Digital Group also gave us a little online quick reference guide that provides a refresher on Tiny Basic commands and error codes. And here is the Tiny Basic command set. And yeah, they do kind of look a little bit unfamiliar compared to more modern basics, but uh, they get the job done. Tiny Basic meant business when it came to saving memory for the most part. There are just 16 commands and most are truncated. Print, for example, is just shortened to PR. List, LST, Next, NXT, and so on. In is short for input, and DTA is what you use for that single data array that is available, I think. Next, we have the Tiny Basic error codes. Tiny Basic doesn't give you a verbose error message like other basics. Basically, you get a number or a code, and to know what Tiny Basic is complaining about, you need to know what the code means. Yep, this is about as stripped down a basic as you could ask for, folks, but that's the way hardware was back in those days. You needed to save every single byte you possibly could. Okay, so let's dive in here and make sure this rig is working. And there's our tiny basic prompt. Now, one thing that's a little strange, you can't just dive in and program here. You see, for some reason, Digital Group included this little sample program, which also appears in their tiny basic manual. I have no idea why, but every time you load Tiny Basic, you end up with this sample program in memory. I've confirmed it's not just my copy of the tape, like someone had written the demo there themselves. Brian's digitized copy also does the same thing. So to do any kind of programming, you have to type new first. So what I'll try first here is just a quick hello world style test here, and that'll just make sure that everything is functional. I've had situations with Tiny Basic where it'll start up and everything looks good and then you start entering commands that should work and they don't. And that usually indicates that there was a problem during loading or a memory problem with the computer. Alright, so we'll just enter in a basic print statement here. And we'll run it. Yep, that seems to work. We are getting a weird error 12 though, which means unrecognizable statement. Hmm. Yeah, this is part of the joy of operating vintage hardware. <laughs> uh, just because the system works and quote unquote boots does not mean it is actually in fact working 100%. Overall, this Digital Group Z80 is amazingly reliable for a nearly 50 year old computer. Usually little glitches like this come down to something being loose, dirty sockets, or other minor things like maybe the odd bad RAM chip. I'm just pleased at this point that it's loading at all. So what I'm going to do here is try a for next loop, what I always like to use just to test things out. Uh, once I remember that next on this machine is actually just NXT, that is. Yeah, there's something hairy here. This is correct, but the system is still throwing up an error 12. Before I go too crazy, let's try readjusting the audio level on the Super Scope and retry loading this thing. Sometimes the second or third time is a charm. Yeah, this looks normal-ish. Okay, so since every load comes with this free test game, I guess I'll check it out. It looks like a standard number guessing game where the computer picks a number at random and you have to guess your way to it in as few attempts as possible, with the computer giving you hints along the way. Alright, well, <laughs> clearly I suck at that kind of game, so yeah, moving along. Let's clear the sample program here and try that for next, I mean, NXT counting thing again. Ah, much better. And yes, it's complaining with error 12 again, but maybe that's because I didn't put an end statement in the final line of the program. Anyway, that kind of gives me confidence that the computer is mostly working all right. I never know for sure, of course. So let's break out the tiny basic collection of games here, and first up is tape number one. 
Now, unlike Commodore Basic, etc., there's no load command within the Tiny Basic interpreter, as I mentioned before. To load something, we have to hit reset and then return to the Tiny Basic loader menu, where there is now an option to read in a basic program or write one. I will usually just type new inside the interpreter first, as I found sometimes the new program doesn't overwrite all the lines of the old one, leading to some really interesting results. With everything so compact, the game shouldn't take much time to load at all. The first one we'll try is Chomp. Now, I'm expecting to have a little bit of trouble with this one. It might be on a damaged area of the tape I just repaired, and when I digitized it, I could see a noticeable drop in the waveform. But maybe we'll get lucky. Amazingly, it seems to be mostly intact. But I can see some extraneous characters which may be problematic. It looks like just one line may be giving us some trouble here. I'm going to try to target it, but as things scroll by so fast, I kind of miss the line number. That's another thing about Tiny Basic. If you want to list from, say, line 100 to line 200, you can, but both line 100 and 200 must exist. So if I tried to list from 100 to 200, but it only went up to line 190, then it would absolutely not do it. Yeah, it'd be pretty miraculous if only this one line were messed up. It kind of seems like it would just be a simple matter of rewriting it to remove the garbage that's in front of the let statement. There could have been something before the let statement, but uh, just looking at the rest of the programming here, I, I don't think it was. So, yeah, I've no way of knowing if there's anything before, but uh, I'll just try fixing it as is here and we'll see what happens when I run it. I'm trying to list the line numbers around here, but between my being too used to newer basic versions, and not being able to see what line numbers are valid to choose from in two points, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. I eventually get a few lines on screen and, well, I'm not a programmer, but it does look like this let statement might just be the extent of it. So, all right, I'll fix it here. Well, Chomp seems to run here, but I have no idea what's going on. I feel like you need to light up or remove everything with asterisks, or... Yeah, I have no idea what's going on here. Uh, yeah, maybe if anyone out in the comments recognizes this game and has any idea how to play it, uh, definitely leave a comment and I'll be happy to try it again. Alright, moving along, we're going to try Checkers here, and as you would expect, the programming for this is pretty substantial, maybe even testing the limits of Tiny Basic a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, taking a little while here. I guess that's the programmer's name. Hey Chuck, if you're still out there. Okay, so now we just wait for the computer to run its calculations and set the board up. And you know, that does take a little while with such a slow CPU. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how aggressive the, I hesitate to call it, AI is. I'm thinking it's not very intelligent overall, but who knows. Uh, yeah, and now I've got the prompts here, and I mistakenly think it wants my moves in the format of X, Y, but that just seems to confuse things. After messing around a bit and noticing the spacing in the computer's moves, I eventually figure out that what it wants is the X coordinate you are moving from first, then hit enter, then at the second question mark, put the Y coordinate. Then you have to put in the X coordinate for where you want to move it to, hit enter, and then the Y coordinate again. It's a little bit clunky, but I'm putting it down to the limitations of Tiny Basic on a computer that was designed in 1975. I think any contemporaneous user would have been happy that they had the ability to do this at all. Yeah, I'd definitely be interested in learning how the computer player is implemented in Tiny Basic here. I may try and digitize this listing and maybe post it somewhere with a link in the description for this video so that you guys can check it out. Maybe somebody with a little more expertise in basic programming can kind of explain what it's doing. 
Next up is DigiGuess, which, you guessed it, is another guessing game. So, if I'm reading the rules right, DigiGuess basically picks a random number from 1 to 9,999, and then you have to figure out how many digits the number is, and then what it is by making guesses as to which numbers are in which positions. It takes me a little while, but I eventually nail it down. And yes, this program is kind of crude, but again, even a crude program back in the 1960s would have required you submitting it to a computer administrator first, and then waiting around for the output to be printed, so the ability to do this in your home must have been just amazing. Now this is some kind of brain teaser. No instructions, so I have no idea how it works. I'm thinking you want to have all ones on the board or something? Yeah, my brain is sufficiently teased and ready to move on here. Next. Okay, this is called Biorhythm. If you're not familiar with what biorhythms are, it's basically kind of a 19th century pseudoscience that held that people's daily lives were affected by the cycles that lasted from periods of 23, 28, and 33 days, each being a different thing, physical, emotional, and intellectual, or something like that. Anyway, somehow mapping these out and figuring out where you were in the cycle could help predict your abilities in each area. Biorhythms became very popular in the 1970s, even manifesting in arcades and on calculators. So naturally, somebody at Digital Group Software Systems shoehorned it into a tiny basic program for Digital Group Systems. Anyway, I'll put in some info to start us off here. And yeah, this looks like kind of a typical biorhythm chart in text form. And I guess it's showing me where my emotional, physical, and intellectual states will be on each day, up, down, or critical. So yeah, it looks like I'm in peak physical form in late September, and then in early October, not so much, and so forth. Yeah, it kind of feels accurate. Okay, well, let's move along here. This is Hammurabi. I'm not really sure if I'm pronouncing that right, or Hammurabi. Uh, it's a classic resource management game, and I know I've seen it on other systems. I think it was released in 1968, actually, and then adapted to BASIC in the early 1970s. And, of course, somebody working for Digital Group Software Systems ported it here. I'm not going to get too in-depth here, but basically it's the classic, you know, buy and sell land, determine how many acres to plant, all as you try to keep your population fed and increasing. Anyway, I suck at it. My six people are doomed, so yeah, I'm going to hit reset here and just put us all out of our little digital misery. Alright, next up is 23 Matches, which I think is basically kind of a version of Pick Up Sticks. Uh, this game is pretty straightforward. You have 23 matches on the ground and each person must pick up three, two, or one matches on each turn. The goal is to force your opponent to be the one who picks up the last match or matches. And predictably, I'm going home with enough matches to light my fireplace for the next five years. Speaking of fires, I'm firing this game and I'm moving on. Now, what compendium of basic games would be complete without Blackjack? This is another not-so-tiny basic program. Thankfully it works, and yeah, it's pretty simple. You get dealt some cards, and based on which cards you've got, you choose to hit or stand. Or, as they refer to it here, stick. And once again, we are treated to the awe-inspiring power of a Zilog Z80 CPU shuffling cards at a whopping 2 MHz. No, it's not frozen, folks. This is exactly how long it takes. And I'm not going to make you suffer it out with me. After the longest wait of my natural life, we are ready. Let's see if I can beat the dealer. Nice, the dealer busted. All right, let's get out of this gambling house before they comp me a hotel room and take all my digital money back the next day. 
Now, for this next quote-unquote tape, we're going to be using the ZTE tablet I paid $20 too much for. As a tablet, this thing absolutely sucks. As an MP3 player, it also sucks, but not quite as bad. I'm going to try and borrow a digital WAV file Brian Blackburn was kind enough to make of what I think is the Tiny Basic Game Set number 5 tape. I say I think because while recording this, I think I discovered one of the tapes he posted is mislabeled and is actually a duplicate of one of mine. Uh, great, so this seems like a biggie again. Yeah, it's taking a little bit of time to load here. I think this one's called Bomber, and I think the goal is to obliterate cities or something like that. You know, just nice light fare. Anyway, I have to pick a side, and why not go with Germany just to be a contrarian? Ah, so I'm a Nazi. Great. Can't I just be a politically non-aligned German bomber pilot who thinks Buckingham Palace is ugly? Alright, fine. I'll bomb Stalin. I'll let you counter the bad juju here. Wait, I get to choose what weapons the enemies have? Can't I just make them all conscientious objectors, armed with spatulas? Hold up, hold up. Missiles? I thought this was World War II. Were there anti-aircraft missiles in World War II, chat GPT? Well, that seems pretty definitive, so since missiles are fictional, I guess it doesn't matter if he has both those and guns. Okay, why am I giving the enemy a leg up here? Ha! Ah, I bet those Russians felt really stupid when they reached for a weapon I gave them that doesn't even exist. Okay, moving along. Ah yes, no 70s computer experience would be complete without trying to land on the moon. Digital Group had a sort of graphical version of this, which I covered in my old video, and we'll do again one day, but this version here in Tiny Basic is purely textual. I barely know what's going on here, but hey, I bombed Stalingrad with no experience. How hard can landing on the moon be? There's no missiles here either. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. Yeah, it's being economical with the fuel here. Yeah, this doesn't seem to be going so well. Ouch. Looks like I space x myself. Anyway, we could play this all day, but we all know how it's going to keep turning out, so let's return to Earth. What else have we got here? Space Battle. <laughs> Yet another in a long, long line of Star Trek-style games. I'll be honest, I'm a terrible geek. I never liked Star Trek. I kind of just tolerated Star Wars. But yeah, I'm not a Star Trek fan at all. Even if I was physically on the USS Enterprise, I think I'd find a way to tune out. We deny you your prize. Fire! And that's kind of what happens when I play these games. You know, I'm more than happy to cede the universe to the Klingons. They want it more than I do. There are some nice explosion effects here, though. Anyway, next. What bullshit is this? Ah, Matador. Lots of dialogue here. So basically I have a charging bull and I choose how to wave my cape. And I can optionally kill the bull, straight up. Man, the 1970s really didn't care about your feelings. So basically, if I'm reading right here, the more gloriously I try to annoy the bull, the more likely I am to get a reward. And dying is not necessarily a bad thing. Check. I actually did bullfighting before I went into IT. The two jobs are remarkably similar sometimes. Hmm. It's asking if I want to kill the bull on the first run. Hardly seems sporting. Is it weird that I'm feeling sympathy for a non-existent digital bull and also thinking about delicious short ribs? Yeah, 
One thing I'm loving about 1970s computer games is the authors had absolutely no problem whatsoever insulting you. Well, I guess I'll go for the kill now. And I'm dead, and the crowd hates me. Just like my YouTube career. Carrying on. Okay, for our next program, what have we here? Hmm. According to the Digital Group documentation, this game should be called Dice, which you would think would involve actual dice. But, uh, there's something much darker going on here. I'm not really sure there's any way to, uh, <laughs> you know, win this one. Click. 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 And I'm dead. <laughs> How did this make it on the tape? Yeah, I am definitely a victim. Man, the ESRB would have fun rating this one. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, this is just weird. There's nothing about this in the documentation whatsoever. Somebody was just having a bad day at work. Okay, so now we get to the game that got me reinterested in these digital group tiny basic gems. Or I guess it's not really a game. It's called Dr. Therapy. Now, when I first formed a mental image of this, I was sort of picturing something like this. Interesting. I wonder if you've considered that not all life choices are binary. Well, they are for me, but not for you. Hmm. But then I remembered this is tiny basic, so probably not all that advanced. Is this thing actually conversational? The program listing is a bit light here for that. And anyway, it looks like we're a victim of some gremlins in the load process on this one, so yeah, we've got some stray characters here. <sighs> Hopefully this works. Nope, it crashes right away at line 80. Let's see if we can fix it. Yeah, I guess it can tolerate weird characters in a print statement, but not in a data array like this. I'll try reloading, but first I want to make sure it's some kind of read error and not the computer actually flaking out again. Yeah, my little program works, so yeah, let's try a reload. Nope, once again we've got a problem. This might be a flaw in the recording. Just have to try my best here to figure out which variable is missing. Looks like A. So yeah, let's replace squiggly with A here. And then we'll give her a run. Yes, it works. Why, thank you. I didn't choose that name, but uh, it works, I guess. Okay, so now we get down to brass tacks and make that $5 I paid for this tape instead of going to a real therapist count. Utubitis is a serious condition, people. It's even in the DSMV. Dang, I wish I could delete here, but you get the idea. By the way, this former Texas Instruments Silent 700 keyboard looks cool, but it really sucks to type on. It's very squishy, and the keys kind of bind a little, and yeah, I keep making mistakes. Hmm, why do I feel like Dr. Digital Group here isn't really listening to what I'm saying? Hey, this really is like real therapy. Well done, guys. Yeah, I think we're kind of just circling at this point. Uh, Dr. Digital Group is just trying to run out the clock on my hour here. Anyway, that's kind of it for this little tour. Yeah, I'm pretty impressed at how well this machine has held up through about five hours worth of filming, despite its age. Yes, it needed a little soldering action to clear up some of those dry solder joints, but otherwise it's amazing to think just how many nearly 50-year-old ICs are packed into this thing, and they still work well enough to play games for a couple of hours. So, I hope you've enjoyed this little operational video of a rare digital group system. There aren't too many of these computers on YouTube, and who knows how much longer we can keep these old beasts running. And yes, things are horribly simple here. Machines like this don't offer much flash, no graphics, no sound, other than the slightly worn out chassis fan, which I'm not sure what it even exists for since no lid was ever sold for the basic box case, but whatever. The thing is, having anything on a screen at all in the mid-70s would have been very impressive to people who were used to going to school and punching out stuff on a teletype or punch card and waiting for output on paper. 
This was like uh, Star Trek in their own homes. We'll come back to this machine again and review some of the other software in a future video. My goal here is to leave behind some better quality videos of this machine than the one I originally shot while it's still alive. Going forward, I'd really love to show you some of the Maxi Basic games to contrast with the Tiny Basic ones. Digital Group sold a whole other set of tapes for that. Sadly, I think only one or two of those tapes are archived anywhere. But we can also look at some games most likely written in assembly language, bypassing Basic altogether. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, smash that like button. If you didn't, hit dislike and I'll send you one of our signature prizes. And of course, if you really love this channel like 29,000 other people do, please consider subscribing or going really hardcore and joining our Patreon. Your support helps fund restoration and maintenance of these wonderful old machines and ensures their next caretaker will be able to keep their legacy alive. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.